Oh, by the way, there is a uh, there was a tablet that was found downstairs. If you're missing a tablet, um, it's right over here. It's a nice tablet. So, let me have you turn tonight to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Mark 10, verses 46 to 52. Um, and we're, we're, we've entitled the message tonight, uh, See Christ now, now, Not Later. And we're going to look at a man uh, that you know as Blind Bartimaeus. So if you would read with me uh, the text tonight, Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. Mark 10, 46 to 52. And they came to Jericho. And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples, a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Tamarius, was sitting by the roadside. And when he had heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And many rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, Call him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And the blind man said to him, Rabbi, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Heavenly Father, we do ask that your word would illuminate our heart tonight, that it would uh, convict us where we need convicting and make us joyful where we need to be joyful. Father, we ask that uh, your word would change us. Uh, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. This was Jesus' first sermon in his hometown of Nazareth. He took the text of the passage from the book of Isaiah. When he said, or in his first sermon, he, he did this. He said, The Spirit of the Lord anointed is upon me, and he anointed me to preach the recovering of sight to the blind. And so, from his first sermon until now, the blind always called for a sympathy from the heart of Jesus. We know that Jesus healed at least five specifically identified blind men. Two others here at Jericho, one at Bethsaida, and a blind man who was washed in the pool of Siloam. And beyond these, the New Testament accounts often says, and they brought to him many who were blind and healed them. And this particular blind man, a picture of the blind man, or, or what God, it's, it's really a picture of what God would like every searcher of Christ to become, every seeker to become. Any unsaved person would do well to use this story as a pattern for seeking Christ. Uh, for this reason, I want you to invite you to devotionally read this story tonight. I want you to identify yourself with him. And we're going to look at the need, the request, the opportunity, the admission, the reception, and his response uh, to Jesus. So let's look at the need of this man. I want you to identify with this man. He had a need. He desperately needed divine help. His miserable condition is described in verse 46. It says, And as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Tamarius, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that Jesus was Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Son of David, have mercy on me. Bartimaeus was a beggar. And his need was summed up in the word blind. Uh, you know, I don't know any other difficulty in life that is more difficult than being blind. One, one, of the, one of the issues in our life probably would be the most difficult would be to be blind. I'd rather lose my hearing than be blind. Uh, if I was blind, I couldn't read. I really enjoy reading. But here was a man who was, who was blind. He had a privation in life and he was helpless. 
And Bartimaeus was was sitting on the roadside. In the case of the man before Jesus, he came to him as only a picture of how we come to Christ. We are spiritually blind. And because of our sin, because of people's sin, we are spiritually blind to the glory and the wonderfulness of Christ. But the blindness we see here, and the, our blindness, is a m much more desperate than mere, mere sight blindness. Many today are suffering from this deeper and darker blindness. It's just all over the place. You, you wonder why they don't get it. They don't know. You, you mention Jesus to them, and they don't see Jesus the way you see him. They, they don't see the Lord the way you see him. It's because they're blind, spiritually blind. The Bible uses many metaphors to describe men's sinful condition, our sinful condition. Deafness, fever, paralysis, leprosy. But I don't believe that any is more forceful than the word blind. To be in a spiritual blind condition is terrible. And the Bible declares in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, the condition of unconverted people. In the words that it says, the God of this world, that means Satan, has but blinded the minds of them which believe not. Least the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. You see, this, the problem with spiritual blindness is people think they're okay. The problem with spiritual blindness is that people think they still can see. The unregenerate, the unquickened, the unconverted mind is so blind that it perceives not the real glory of the all-attractive person of Christ. And I want to say that, that Christ is all-attractive. That the process of us coming to Christ, when God opens our eyes, that we might see the risen glory of Christ, it is beautiful for the believer, isn't it? Christ is beautiful. He's attractive. I realize here on earth the Bible says he had no stately form or majesty. But to the believing eye, when we see Christ in all of his glory, it is beautiful to recognize Christ. He's attractive. He, he, he makes you want to go to him and, and kneel at him and wonder at him. See, the characteristics of blindness is that even though a light may be shining brightly, a blind person cannot even be aware that it's shining at all. In the third chapter of Revelation, Jesus addressed his church that boasts that it had needed nothing. But he said, you are blind and you don't even know it. Your family and friends that do not profess Christ are blind, spiritually blind. And you'll notice also in the case of Bartimaeus that his blindness had had adverse effects. Because of his blindness, he was poor and forced to beg for a living. And because of his poverty, he was treated with indifference. He didn't even have a name. Mark calls him Bartimaeus. But all that means is he was the son of the man named Timarius. What his own name was, if he had one, no one knew and no one cared. What a symbol of this is, of what sin has done to man. Apart from Christ, our sins have divorced us from the, our true identity. It has separated us from the dignity that God has imparted to us by created. We are like Bartimaeus in desperate, desperate need of divine help. And so if we're going to come to Christ, or if someone's going to come to Christ, they have to understand their own blindness, their own need. We have a need. The next thing I want you to understand is that there was a request. Look at verses 46 and 47. Really, at 47, it says, When he heard that Jesus of Nazareth began, was, was, was excuse me, when Jesus of Nazareth that was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Once he knew his need, he requested something. 
He requested something. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the words of Christ. And, so, and Bartimaeus heard the mention of Jesus' name. He probably had heard a, little, a great deal about Jesus because he addresses Jesus as the son of David. And he had undoubtedly heard about this man's miraculous cure of other blind men. And, and he felt that this state of destiny had arrived. So he raised his voice and he cried out, Jesus, son of David. Have mercy on me. And the sooner as he raised his voice to shout the petition to Christ, the Bible says many charged him that he should be, hold his peace or be quiet or silenced him. Let me just say this. Many who come to Christ are going to have people in their own lives tell them that they're foolish. When we recognize our spiritual need and we cry out to Jesus for mercy, there are going to be people in our lives that think we've gone off the rocker. That we're going through a fad. I mean, that's what my parents thought I was going through when I accepted Christ. I was going through a fad. It was when I was 21 years old that I accepted my Lord and Savior my parents thought it was a fad. It was something that I was going to grow out of. You don't grow out of Jesus. Jesus is not a fad. It's not something you try out. See, people who are true believers, they're convicted of their sin. They, they recognize their blindness. They recognize their, their alienation from God. And, and they cry out to God. And they ask God for his mercy. I mean, if Bartimaeus had listened to the words of those around him, he would have said, okay, I'll, I won't cry it out anymore. I'll be quiet. Perhaps his fellow beggar said, close your mouth. If you continue to make a loud noise, the magistrate of Jericho will order us all beaten and cast into prison. The citizens of Jericho might have said, keep still, Bartimaeus. Who wants to hear from the likes of you when the great prophet is passing by? It's even possible that maybe the apostles of Jesus rebuked him and told him to be quiet. On the other hand, if Bartimaeus had listened to the voice of unbelief within himself, he would have remained in his misery. When he heard that Jesus was passing by, his unbelief began to suggest to his mind, I'm only a beggar. He wouldn't have time for me. Even if he did heal me, I would have nothing to pay him for his service anyway. The crowd would never let him come near me. Furthermore, he probably thought, I'm blind, and there's no one to guide me. And if, I, if, if he could open my eyes, I, I can perish no quicker than by asking than if I didn't ask. And the Bible says many charged him that he should hold his peace or that he should be quiet, telling him to be silent. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13 says, You shall seek me and find me when you search with me for me with all your heart. I think Bartimaeus had a whole heart searching for Jesus. He sought Jesus because the blinders on his eyes were lifted. Uh, I guess yesterday, I, I'm, I'm not a horse racing fan. Are you horse racing fans? Do you, do you like horse racing? Do you ever go to the track? Oh, I'm sorry, this is a Baptist church. We don't go to the track, right? My mom was a big horse person. And uh, one of the things that um, I'm always fascinated by, you know, the, the, the horses, they, you know, they have these blinders on, you know, so they only see what is straight ahead or, or what's, what's right ahead of them. And, and, they, and they, can't see, they can't see around them. Um, and so when they run, uh, they're, they're running with a focused attention. Their, their eyes are focused on the, what, they're, what they're running for. And, of course, the jockey is controlling them and, 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 and pushing them. And I think sometimes when, well, I think all the time, I think really when our eyes are opened by the Holy Spirit and, and, and it's because of the preaching and the sharing of the Word. And let, let me just say this, that when you share the Word of God, it's the Spirit of God that opens their eyes. It's the Spirit of God. You can't fail in witnessing. 
Well, in fact, you can fail. Let me just say this. You can, the only way you can fail is in witnessing is to fail to witness. Did you get that? The only way you can fail in witnessing is to fail to witness. You can, you can witness obnoxiously, poorly, angrily, many times maybe incorrectly in some points, but the only way you're going to ultimately fail in witnessing is to fail to witness if your heart is obedient. But Barmaeus repeated it again. He said, have mercy on me. God be merciful to me, like the, the publican, a sinner. When David sinned and sought forgiveness, he did not begin his petition by listing his sins. He said, have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercy, blot out my transgressions. And only then did he say, I acknowledge my transgression." I think one of the great ways you can start any Bible study or any time you're that is just say, God, have mercy. Because we don't know our sin. Even as believers in Christ, we are blind to some things. I'm blind. You're blind to some things we don't even know about in our own heart of hearts. And so there's a need. There, there, is, a, there is a request and then, then there's a seeking or there's a opportunity. And in this story, there's a man who quickly accepted his spiritual opportunity. Look at the 49th verse. It says, And Jesus stopped and called him. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. In verse 50, he says, And throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. But I want you to go back and look at what happened to Jesus. When, Je when, when this man cried out, what did Jesus do? He stopped. Jesus was walking, continuing to walk. There were probably needs all around Jesus. Jesus had needs all around him. But when he heard the cry for mercy, he stopped. Charles Spurgeon remarks on this. He says, The sincere prayer of a repenting sinner always lays hold, lays hold of Christ by the feet. Though Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem to accomplish the great atonement for sin by dying on the cross, he stopped and turned his attention to a blind beggar. And he stood still and commanded that Bartimaeus be called and bring, brought to him. And they said to him, take heart, get up, he's calling you. If you've been struggling with sin, and, and, and many times when people struggle with their own sin, and let me just say, there, there are sins that um, we don't struggle with. Many, 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 many times there are, sins in, there are sins that we call sins that we don't struggle with, but there are sins what we would call hidden sins of the heart that we all struggle with. Um, no one who comes to church, no, no pastor, no one is free from the battle that goes on inside of the heart. And the Spirit of God is there opening up our hearts and opening it up wider and wider and wider and wider. And we, and we see our sin more and more and more clearly and we, we, we realize how much more mercy we need from God every single day. I, I can't imagine the feeling that Bartimaeus is saying, you know, he's asking for mercy. And then God, Christ, calls him. And he comes. He throws off his garment. And I think in this, this, this story here, he throws off his cloak, sprang up and came to Jesus. And I asked the question to myself. I, I ask myself questions that I can't answer sometimes. Why did he throw off his cloak? Why, why did he throw off his garment? 
I mean, the text really doesn't elaborate on this, but he, he throws off his garment, and, and the only thing I can think of is that this, this cloak may have been something in his life that would have prevented him from, from coming to Jesus. He throws it off, springs up, and he comes to Christ and stands at his feet. So here we are seeking. We, here, here's a man who recognizes his need, who, who requests mercy, and who acts on the request of Christ. And then he specifies his personal need. Look what Jesus says to him. Verse 51, he says, And what do you want from me? What do you mean, actually, what do you want me to do for you? I mean, Jesus just came right out and said, well, What should I do? Oh, why did he ask that? He certainly knew the man was blind. But I think Bartimaeus had to admit it himself. He had to come to Jesus and admit to, it, to Jesus himself that he needed to exercise faith that God would be able to forgive. Many would find it hard to answer. We take so much for granted when we come to Christ. We, we become familiar with Christ. And think about it just in your own mind when you came to Christ. It was all new. You bowed before God and you said, God, save me. I believe you're my Lord and you're my Savior. And you called upon him and everything was so new and so fresh. And you couldn't get, wait to get home to tell your friends and family what you had just done. And some of them said, yay, and some of them said, boo. But you were excited about it. Sometimes I think when we listen to sermons, we, you can listen to sermons, but sometimes we have to pray that God would do something because of the sermon in our own lives. Pray to God. When you leave tonight, pray to God that whatever you're struggling with, whatever, whatever the blindness in our own heart, ask God to open it up and, and ask God to have mercy and, 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 and call out to God for mercy and then, then ask him and have a conversation and say, this is what I want you to do for me. God wants to do that. He hears, as Spurgeon says, the, the repentant prayer of a repentant sinner because it grabs Jesus at the feet and Jesus stops and listens. In verse 52, he gets what he asked for. I call this the reception. He had a need. He had a request. He calls out to Jesus. Jesus asks him what he wants him to do and he tells him specifically and Jesus said to him, what does it say in verse 52? Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. Now, I find it interesting that uh, Jesus said, go your way and he follows Jesus. He doesn't go back to his home. He doesn't go back anywhere else. He follows Jesus and Jesus told him to, I mean, uh, it seems like go, go your way. Go, go back home. Go where you need to be. And he chooses to stay with Jesus. He immediately receives what he's asked for. And it says immediately he recovered his sight. It wasn't there are a lot of people that say, I have the gift of divine healing. I think every, I, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think most instances in the Bible, the person who is healed, especially by Jesus, is done like that. Uh, let, me, let me say, my belief, I do believe people still, uh, I'm, I'm not a cessationist, meaning that I do believe that the miraculous gifts are, are, can still be used today. 
but I think that more normally, Jesus, God uses different means and different methods that he uses just uh, through, through our lives. But God can heal. And can, God can give gifts of healing to people. But here was a man who healed, and, and when Jesus healed, it was always like that, immediately. It wasn't over days or weeks or months. It was like that. And it's because this man asked for mercy, and he immediately God sighed. Think what he saw. If you had been blind for a long time and all of a sudden you could open your eyes, what would you see? What would you look at? There's a crowd all, probably all around him. There was this blue sky above him. The walls of Jericho and the hills of Moab stretching beyond him. And the first thing that he saw was what? Jesus. And when you and I wake from the dream of life, and when the scales of time, and all the stuff that goes on that keeps us blinded, and, we, and they're poured out of our eyes, and we look into the face of Jesus, I think that sight is going to stir us more than we ever knew. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 2, the Bible says we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is is. And in verse 52, he followed Jesus on the way. He followed Jesus along the way. See, this is a picture of a true convert. The moment his sins forgiven are forgiven, the, the one thing he wants to do is get close and follow Jesus and serve him. This is one of the proofs that the eye said of Bartimaeus had really been restored. And to follow Jesus is one of the proofs that a professing convert sin has been forgiven and they are saved. See, I think that Jesus of Nazareth is always passing by. He's ever present. He's ever present. Jesus is always around. If you think about it from our point of view, when we tell people about Jesus, Jesus is there. He's everywhere. And, and we're not trying to get people to think the right things. We're trying to introduce someone, to introduce people to a living God. We're trying to introduce people to Jesus, who is a real person that they need a real relationship with. It doesn't do any good just to get people to say the right words. A blind person can, can repeat what you say. But a sightful person who looks into the face of Jesus is going to love him, is going to want to follow him. And I would say tonight that the idea of Bartimaeus, son of Tamirius, is a great story about how people come to faith in Christ. And if you were, I could use this story, go walk up to somebody and say, here, let me, let me tell you a story about someone who I was like and how you are like today. Now let me tell you, if you're blind, you know, this is an old thing. How, how do you tell a blind person what the color green is? How do, you, how do you tell a blind person that the sky is blue or the clouds are puffy? They, they have no conception, if they've been blind from birth, what any of that is. What any of that is. And so sometimes when we proclaim the gospel, we have to realize that people in front of us are blind and unless the Holy Spirit removes the scales from their eyes, they're not going to understand or see. 2 Corinthians, I believe, 2.14 
says the natural man does not understand the things of God for they are spiritually discerned. See, we have a sight problem. Now, believers have a sight problem. Our eyes aren't perfect. Your eyes aren't perfect. My eyes aren't perfect. But if we rest on the mercy of God and we call out to God because every one of us in this room needs God's mercy there's no one accepted we're all on even, even ground we, we, we serve God we, we love God but there are hidden things in our hearts that we don't know about yet that even though God has opened our eyes and we have, some of, you, some of us have said yes to Jesus, said yes to following him, said yes to, to, to whatever he asks, some of us still struggle with things that we're rebelling. I love the image of kingdoms. God has a kingdom and man has a kingdom. And the reason why we don't always well God's kingdom is is the Bible says when it says inter, let, me, let me put it this way you remember the, the, the verse that says enter by the narrow way for the broad way leads to what happiness destruction right right that's why I can never understand why people would name a church Broadway Baptist Church. That there are churches named that, and I always go, you got to change that name. But if you think about it, here's a man who is blind and now can see. Because he knew his need for Jesus. And I pray tonight as you go home that you, I don't care how long you've been a believer in Christ, you still need the mercy of Jesus Christ. Would you pray with me?